before they changed it to two semesters. So I think it's just one semester. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. We've started here. Uh, I'll pull this up here so you can see. So two of the students, Mr. Friedel and Mr. McKenna, are putting together uh, an RF transmitter and they're starting with basic inductors and resistors and uh, capacitors and stuff. And then, uh, so this is from chapter nine, is that right? Ten. Chapter, ten? Yeah. chapter 10 from the book. Uh, discusses some of the electronics involved, lays out uh, circuit, uh, basic circuit required to get an RF transmitter. And um, this is in the FM band. And uh, so, and then it uh, shows the basic circuit diagram, and, and there's a, uh, I ordered these that uh, Dr. Rizzi uh, uh, had a, set up with a company that does printed circuit boards, and so I ordered some, some of these. Um, and so this allows you to solder in, it's, it's laid out according to the circuit, and it allows you to easily solder in the components and stuff like that. Uh, so this will be about this big when they're done. Although they said they've started with a solderless breadboard rather than doing a laid out PCB. But uh, anyway, makes it kind of easy. So when they get that done, we'll have, have them come in in class and demonstrate the, uh, their, so we'll get a radio, just a regular FM radio and turn it on and see what it sounds like. Uh, I had one, one student who tried this a couple of years ago and he got frustrated, he couldn't get it to work. Some reason I, I never figured out what was wrong with it, and he just emailed me last week. Said he finally got it to work. <laughs> he wants to come into class. <laughs> so, so you may invite him in. If, uh, <laughs> finally got it. <laughs> he was excited. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So we're working uh, still here on uh, on on the chapter on Maxwell's equations, and we're focusing now on uh, radiation and and. Uh, and the wave equation uh, related topics. Uh, and so we're going to go over the worksheet. Why don't you just hold on to your worksheet and we'll go over it now in class. You can correct it and stuff as we go through it. Uh, so uh, to go back a little bit here, so we have, remember, um, let, me, let me specify, draw this a little bit clearer what I've got. Suppose we have an antenna. Uh, oriented like this, uh, and and there's current flowing in the antenna. Uh, let's say that it's a function of, uh, and I'm going to set up a coordinate system, x and y, like this. And uh, so I've got current flowing in the antenna. It's specified uh, so there's a, uh, it's not uniformly distributed along the length of the antenna. Uh, so it's some current as a function of y and time, and the antenna has length L, and the antenna, let's say, is operating at a certain frequency, so it, uh, one possibility, as it's described in the text, would look like this. Uh, so this oscillates both in time and also has a distribution over the length of the antenna, so let's, let's do plot this I of Y would look like this, from minus L over 2 to L over 2, so the current in this particular setup would actually um, go to zero at the ends of the antenna. This is one, poss one possibility. And you could find uh, the continuity equation would be that the derivative of I with respect to Y is equal to the negative derivative of the charge density with respect to time. And uh, uh, so that would be the continuity equation. And so you could, from this, you could figure out what the charge distribution looks like. And I think it's something like this, if I remember correctly. Okay, and then these oscillate in time uh, with this frequency omega here. And uh, so now the question is, a very simple question, what is the A field out here and uh, phi as well? What are the phi and A fields at some location here, a distance x away from the center of the antenna as a function of time? And, and we're going to pose the question to make it simple. Let's put it on the midline between the uh, antenna so that it's uh, there's a lot of symmetry helps us to evaluate the uh, intervals more easily. Okay, so now the uh, retarded solution for the equation, remember that connects the, uh, remember the equation here is uh, del inversion of A, there's four pi 
J, and J is the volume version of the current density. So we have the source, and we want to find out what A is, and that uh, looks like in integral form, looks like this. It would be in the y direction, I naught over C times this uh, cosine pi y prime over L, integrating over y prime, integrating over the source. Okay, the distance from a point on the source to the point on that line here is this script R. And remember, script R is then square root of x squared plus y prime squared, square root of that. Okay, so this is the, and, and then there's the retarded time. The retarded time is the time at which we want to know the value of A, uh, but taking into account the propagation, so it's the distance from that particular point of the source divided by the speed of the signal, which is the speed of light. OK, so that's a little complicated to do exactly, that integral. You see the, the y prime appears in several places here. The variable of integration is here and down here and also inside the, the time there. So it's a little bit of a complicated integral. But we're not really interested in A everywhere. We're really interested in the far field. And so there are two conditions here that we want to look at. The far field would be that x is much greater than the length of the antenna. So we want to get really far away compared to the length of the antenna. But that's not the only length scale in the problem. What's the other length scale in the problem? There's clearly the length of the antenna, but there's another length scale. Can anybody see what it is? Time. Well, that's not a length scale, is it? Yeah. All right. R. Uh, script R. So Script R has a combination of, of Y prime and X, and uh, Y prime is limited by L, so, so X is the other thing we're comparing. So there's another thing we compare X to. So what is, y. Uh, okay, Y, so there's Y prime uh, that is the Y coordinate of the source, but then that's the only Y, and that's limited by L, so that's the same thing here. There's no Y for the point out here, because we're considering it right on the, x-axis. So remember what the field does, it oscillates. Because the source is oscillating, well, there's an oscillating field and it oscillates both in time and in space, which is the wavelength. And that's determined by the frequency. Remember the frequency, uh, remember the relationship lambda nu is equal to c, omega is uh, 2 pi nu, And uh, so uh, lambda is then C over nu. Okay, so there's the wavelength is fixed by a combination of the frequency of the source and then the speed of propagation, which is a property of a plot. So the other thing that we want in this far field solution is that x is also going to be much greater than lambda, the wavelength. We want it to be greater than both. And lambda uh, and, the, and the length of the antenna are independent of each other, right? The, you could have the wavelengths longer than the, the length of the antenna, or you could have it the other way around. The wavelength is short compared to the length of the antenna. So we want both. We want the far field solution is going to be much greater than either of those. Okay. Okay, now if you go back then, in, in that condition, you can, you can examine. I'm not going to do it here. He does it in the book. But you can see that you could use a Taylor series to simplify the integrand sum by taking the dominant contribution here. In that. So I'll sketch it here for you. Um, this piece, the distance, x is much, so y prime is limited by L. It goes between negative L over 2 and L over 2. So x is much bigger in magnitude than y prime. So we can easily approximate that by x plus correction, which would be uh, 1 half y prime squared over x. Okay, but, but the dominant contribution is just that first piece, x, that first term. And the retarded time then is t going to be dominantly t minus x over c. Okay, so that, that's going to allow us to simplify it. And you'll find that a will go like uh, y i know i naught over c x cosine, um, uh, let's see, omega t minus, I should write this way to keep it consistent.
consistent omega t minus k x, where uh, omega is equal to k c, or rather I should say k is equal to omega over c. Okay, it's a wave number. It's determined by the frequency and the speed. Okay, and that, that will be the dominant contribution far away. Okay, but notice that there's still something to be we, we need to look at here. This is varying somewhat with x, but this varies very quickly with x, right? Because k is equal to 2 pi over lambda, and so the wavelength here, we're comparing the wavelength here, which is the oscillations in the cosine go like the wavelength, and we're comparing it to this, which doesn't oscillate, it just dies off slowly. So if you look at the at the nature of this, these this wave, it, it's concentric spherical waves that are propagating outward from the source. Uh, we're just going to consider right here along the x-axis, and then if we get really close in there, it looks like the wave fronts are actually planar, because you're really close in to the axis. You don't have to consider that the waves are actually pieces of spherical waves propagating outward from the source. Hang on a second, Mr. Lucid, I'll get you. And then, uh, so the, the point is that we can approximate A by a plane wave. And the plane wave is where the wave fronts are parallel to each other and spaced along X and in fact are sequential planes. This is called a plane wave. So we don't have quite a plane wave from this, but if you get close in over a limited region, it looks like a plane wave. And that plane wave then is what we're considering here in this problem. Y not uh, y hat a not cos kx minus omega t. So that's how we get to the plane wave from the source. It describes the uh, emitted a field pretty well over a, a narrow region, and, and we're going to focus on that because it's mathematically simpler than the, the description of the field over a larger region. Okay, Mr. Luker. I was just confused on that one equation where you have omega t minus kx. Uh, what's, yeah. the, what's the difference between that and like kx minus the, uh, omega t? Like, where do you change that? Right. Is there a difference? Cosine of z, how does that compare to cosine of negative z? Same thing. It's the same. Okay. Yeah, there's no difference. And the, the reason that I, I wrote it this way is because it corresponds back here. If you go back to this, uh, you see in the retarded time here, it shows up in the retarded time as omega t minus kx. And so if I, if I started with the retarded time, then I would write it as omega t minus kx. But oddly enough, people, I don't know, the practice seems to be, see, there it is. There's, that comes from the retarded time. But oddly enough, in the... Uh, uh, you, you just see people writing it this way, kx minus omega t. I don't know why. There really isn't any difference. Yeah. Okay, so now let's go. So this is what we're considering. This is called a plane wave. And so your homework dealt with a plane wave solution. And uh, so we were just going to pick apart the plane wave and study it. And uh, you, so you can see the frequency here. Where does, what determines the frequency? The source, right? The oscillation of the source, which is set up by you, you know, somebody. Um, and then the the wave number is a combination of um, the source frequency and the speed of propagation, which is a property of the plana, speed of light. The amplitude here is again determined by the source. It's the strength. It's a combination of the, of the intensity of the current in the wire and um, so that's proportional to that. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, we're not going to look at the phi. We could have looked at the phi solution as well. We're going to focus on A because the radiation is dominantly determined by the A field. The A field is really the interesting part when we're talking about radiation. Okay. So what is the dimensionality then of, uh, of omega? Inverse time, which you can see here because the cosine of omega t the argument of the trig function has to be dimensionless. So therefore, omega must have uh, inverse time. And it's a, it is a, a, a rate, a frequency. And so k, 
the dimensionality of k also by the same argument cos kx must be dimension has have a dimensionless argument so k must be inverse length and um, okay so you sketch this field at a particular time uh, as a function of x and so it looks like this this is a at some particular time as a function of x and k then you can see corresponds to the uh, 2 pi over k corresponds to the separation between maxima of the value of a so it's the wavelength so that shows that k is 2 pi over lambda and so this is for a fixed time I want to make the sketch also for fixed x so let's pick a particular location and study how the amplitude oscillates in time, the A field oscillates in time, and it'll do something similar like that. And here the, uh, the thing that corresponds now to the separation between the peaks is the period, which is 2 pi over omega. Okay. Okay, now the, the thing is to look at this as a function of time, as a full uh, function of time and space. And so what, what we will consider, for example, let's set t equals to zero. Let's go back to that plot. Then the, then the function will look like this. It will have uh, be cosine kx. All right. And so there's a maximum right there at x equals to zero. And let's follow that maximum, maximum as a function of time in the full solution, which is kx minus omega t. So for that thing to be a, a uh, maximum, it's going, to it's going to persist, it's going to shift in one direction or the other. And the way to look at that is, let's look at the, at the argument of the cosine. We want to set the argument of the cosine to zero. And that corresponds to that one maximum that we're looking at. And setting that to, to zero gives you that x is equal to omega over kt, which is in that combination omega over k will be the speed of propagation then. You can see the relationship between k and omega. C is the speed of the shift of the wave in time, the maximum of the wave. OK, so uh, is this called, is this locomotion? I mean, this looks like linear, this looks like um, uniform linear translation. Is it locomotion? Is it proper to call it locomotion? I mean, essentially. You say it's, <coughs> it's propagation locomotion? Right, yeah. Is propagation essentially locomotion? No. Mr. He uh, Mr. Ben. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Hetherington. Why is that not properly uh, locomotion? It's analogous to locomotion, but there's no momentum. Right. Work. Yeah, because there's no massive body, right? We're talking about a massless medium, the plana, which has, which is, occupies all the region between massive bodies. A massive body causes the field in the plana. So this is not, properly speaking, locomotion. It is propagation, but it's analogous. It has a lot of similarity to propagation. So propagation means, remember the, the influence in the plana is being spread from one part of the plana to another part. So plana propagation is similar to, but not essentially, locomotion of a massive body because the plana is, is, has no mass. Right? It's not the plana that's moving. It's the influence that is being passed along from one part of the plana to the other, and that happens very quickly at the speed of light. Okay, so the speed of propagation is this omega over k. Then. All right, so the next part then is to, is to, from the A field, we want to extract the E and B fields and study them. And the E field, how do we get those? We're neglecting the phi. Yeah, the A field. So what is E in terms of the A field? Negative 1 over C. Okay. Partial derivative with respect to A. And there's a factor of C in there. And how about the D field? It's a curl of A. And you, if you make a plot of A, you can see why, why it's very obvious why A changes in time. And also A is curling, right? Because you have, here's the A field at 
at different locations, and there's definitely a curl in that because it's changing perpendicular to itself. It's changing in the direction of propagation, but the direction of A is is in the y direction, so there's a, it's, there is definitely a curl to that. Okay, so then you can uh, just take the time derivative and the um, uh, uh, curl of that thing. So the time derivative. Then so we have a minus one over c, and then we had a, a y a naught, and then we get a it's a cosine, so we get omega here. I'm sorry, k, excuse me, k sine kx minus omega t. Ah, oh, excuse me, no, I'm wrong. I messed that up again. Mixing up the curl and the time derivative in my head. Uh, so we get we actually so we start off with a negative sign, and we get a negative sign for the derivative of the cosine. There's also another negative sign because it's negative omega t, so we get two negative signs. So we end up a total of three negative signs. They're still negative sine kx minus omega t. There we go. There's the e field. Now remember this is this is an analogical extension of the electric field. It's not an electric field strictly speaking, because the electric field strictly speaking is charge is caused by a charge distribution. Yeah, did I mess something up? There's an omega. There isn't an omega squared. You saw an omega squared? I didn't see one. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so uh, this it's not strictly speaking an electric field, properly speaking. Uh, if we included the phi, the negative grad phi term, if we calculate phi and include that, that would be an electric field. But, but remember, Maxwell analogically extends the E field to include this A dot effect term because of, they have the same effect. Okay, and uh, now let's take the curl. And the curl is going to be if, uh, if we have x, y, and z in, that, uh, in our picture here, x, y, z will be coming out of the board. Then we need the curl, and I'm, gonna, I'm sure I'm going to get this messed up here. So it's going to be anyway z a naught. Now we get a k, and we get sine kx minus omega t. And uh, is it plus or m minus? Is it number one over c? No, sir. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you saw one over c. I didn't see one. <laughs> and uh, so, is there a negative sign? I can't. I think it's negative. Is there a negative? Yeah. That's a. I'm going to take a vote. <laughs> I guess I could figure it out. Yeah, derivative is y, x, y. Yeah, it should be a negative. OK. Uh, OK, now the, the question is, does this, do these satisfy Maxwell's equations? And uh, so you're just trying to direct substitution. Remember this, the curl equations uh, and the divergence equations. Okay, and remember, we're far away from the source, so there's no rho, no j. And so Maxwell's equations in, away from the source would be the divergence of E is going to be 0, and the divergence of B would be 0. We need to be sure that those are both satisfied. And you can see here uh, that E changes, is pointing in the y direction, but changes in the x direction, which means that there's no divergence. And, and B is pointing in the z direction, but changes in the x direction, so again, no divergence that they're both satisfied from that. You should check that, you know, the detail of it. And then we have the equations, the curl of E is minus 1 over C dB dt, and that should be identically satisfied, remember, because that equation simply says that E is the time derivative of A. So that, that one should, if you've made a mistake somewhere, it would, might show up there, but it should be identically satisfied. And then this one, you should check also to make sure that your connection to the Displacement current. Okay, and so those should be satisfied. Uh, okay, so um, uh, and and the the other thing about that, remember that that E and B have the share are shared in the source in that uh, in this case. They're both generated by the current. Remember, we're tracking only the part that's generated by the current. And so, of course, they're correlated with each other because they come from the current. OK, 
Okay, so now in the previous problem, when you substitute in this, you'll, you'll find you get this relationship that, uh, um, uh, let's see here, uh, omega over c is equal to k. That will have to be true in order for them to satisfy the wave equation, equation from the source, these equations. I think it's in, in the form of squared. Omega over c squared is equal to k squared. So that's imposed by the fauna. That's imposed by the nature of the medium through which it's propagated. The frequency is imposed by the source. The wave, the wave number is as a result is determined by how fast the thing propagates in the fauna. And this is called the dispersion relation. Omega is equal to kc is called the dispersion relation. Another way of writing it, we write it in terms of the wave length, 2 pi c over lambda. You see there's that proportional wavelength. This means that this is called dispersionless. This leads to dispersionless propagation. That means that, that all, wa all uh, wavelengths have the same speed of propagation. So all colors have the same speed of propagation in the vacuum. Red, white, radio waves, x-rays, they all have the same speed of propagation. And so this is, that's called dispersionless relation, uh, uh, propagation which is what happens in the vacuum. But if you have, for example, something like glass, and you have light propagating in glass, the different colors travel at different speeds, and so you get a dispersion of white light into the colors. That's why this is called dispersionless propagation, because the colors remain together. If you propagate it to a medium like glass, you get a dispersion of the colors, and, and you can actually see the rainbow as a result. The prism creates a rainbow, a prism uh, shape of the glass creates a rainbow. Uh, so this, this wave equation that we're discussing here would not pertain, for example, to glass. We'd have to modify this equation to, uh, to cover propagation in glass, for example, because we're getting here, and, and the equation we're considering is just dispersionless propagation. Okay. Okay, then you're gonna make a sketch of the E and B field and that the uh, and you can see here uh, from from this that they're in sync with each other, right? These are in sync. When one has a maximum, the other one does. And when one has a node, the other one does. In other words, a zero. So they have their zeros lined up and their maxima lined up. And E and B are perpendicular to each other. E is parallel to the A field, B is perpendicular to the A field. All we need to describe this is just the A field, but it's convenient to look at it in terms of the E and B field. Okay, so now the question is on the, ba the basis of this, is it justified to say that in, in these, uh, these two of Maxwell's equations that changing B causes curling E or that changing E causes curling B? Is that justified? No. 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 It's just, they are correlated because they come from the same source, but it makes no, you can't, it would be a non sequitur to say one causes another. Just because the number of apples equals the number of oranges doesn't mean that one causes the other, right? There's some, in this case, there's more of a relationship simply than the number of apples or the number of oranges, but. Okay, and uh, now we're also to consider the Lorentz gauge condition. The, the gauge condition is kind of, uh, is implied in what I had done before, and I didn't point it out here. When I, when I uh, wrote down uh, this solution here, when I wrote down this solution, I didn't tell you about something uh, that he does tell you about in the text, and that is this, this solution that connects this equation to this equation, that is the solution of this the differential equation, implies also, uh, uh, requires further specification. That is, the solution to this equation is not unique by itself. I have to specify a further condition. But it's quite quite reasonable physical condition. And there are two conditions. One is that the source is contained in a finite region. You don't have sources extending to infinity. 
That's a reasonable condition to put on the source. And the second is a so-called gauge condition. Uh, and the gauge condition arises from, from something like this. Let's, let's look, go back to look at, for example, the E, uh, uh, yeah, let's look at the B field. Look, for example, at the B field. Uh, I could add to the A field a piece which is the um, the gradient of some function. Yeah. Suppose I did that. B does not change. The B field doesn't change because the uh, curl of the piece that I added is zero because the curl of a gradient is always zero. So when I was learning electrodynamics, like the magnetism, uh, this, this was an argument that A is not real. Because you could change the value of A by adding an arbitrary function to it. Uh, not an arbitrary function, but a function which is the gradient of an arbitrary function. You could change A. And this is called a gauge transformation. So there seemed to be an ambiguity to A. A didn't seem to be nailed down, whereas if it's something physical, it ought to be nailed down. It should, shouldn't be just something we can change arbitrarily. It's a, but it turns out to be a little bit like the potential energy. Remember, the potential energy, we could change our zero of the potential energy. As far as we were concerned in the problems that we did, it didn't matter what our reference point was particularly. For example, if I'm studying the motion of, of a body flying around here in the room and I'm, I'm throwing things around, I could choose this table as my reference for the potential energy, or I could change the floor, or I could choose the floor of the basement, or I could choose the roof. It doesn't matter where I choose the zero of potential energy. And this is kind of the same thing. Uh, it's a little bit more, it's a little richer than that because it's, it involves a function. Uh, but it does, it's not correct to conclude because within the context of doing these problems, I don't have a reference point. I don't have a fixed reference point for my potential energy. I could choose it arbitrarily doesn't mean that, there, that the potential energy cannot somehow, by some physical principle, there can't be a reference point that makes sense to choose, okay? It just means that for the purposes of doing these problems, I don't need one. I can choose it arbitrarily. Okay, and the same thing is true for the A field, because there are a lot of problems where if I, if I do calculations, I, um, the choice of the gauge or this transformation has no effect on the on the motion of a particle, for example. And so, uh, but it, but there are certain cases where it does have an effect. Uh, the A field does have an effect on the, on this, and those were not that was actually not known at the time when I. It's been that long since I've been in your uh, shoes. Okay, so this is this is a uh, uh, he he. he discusses this then, and he, and he talks about there's actually a, a good reason for choosing something that fixes the value of A. And, and uh, that is called the Lorentz condition, and I think it's L-O-R-E-N-Z. I think there's about six guys named Lorentz. Is there a T in there? And, and there's like three with a T and three without a T. This one's not. This one's Number not. One with a T. This one's not. Yeah. I, I never can remember. There, there are several of them with the same, almost the same name. Spelling differs by nothing important, right? Um, it's pronounced the same. And anyway, this is called the Lorentz gauge condition. And he argues that this is actually a physical condition because it, if there should be a relationship between momentum flow and energy flow. And if the A is a, the vector potential is a potential momentum, and phi is a potential energy, or is a potential momentum per unit charge, and phi is a potential energy per unit charge, and there should be a relationship between that, because energy flow and momentum flow are related to each other. So he makes a, uh, draws an analogy, for example, to current. We have the continuity condition, um, that's conservation of charge. And so this is kind of like a conservation of energy, but it's analogous, remember, because the planet does not carry momentum, does not carry energy. So it's an analogous argument. Okay, so anyway, that's, that's something to be aware of. And so the question here is, is uh, does it satisfy uh, the, 
the gauge condition, and, and in which case what you're having to say is that because we've chosen phi to be zero, the question is whether the divergence of A is zero. And in fact, it, it is zero because A is in the y direction, but it changes in the x direction. So it changes perpendicular to itself, not parallel to itself. And so if you work out the Cartesian form of the divergence, you get zero. So it does satisfy the Lorentz gauge condition here. And it also satisfies the wave equation. Remember the wave equation in one dimension will be um, A should be zero. And this gives you omega squared over c squared minus k squared times a is equal to zero. And that's equal to zero if you have, in fact, that relationship between omega and k. So in fact, omega is equal to kc. OK, so it does satisfy the wave equation if, if omega and k are related to each other that way. OK, so and then uh, I want to get to to the uh, what would happen to a charged particle here, I want to consider that. That's actually an interesting and fairly, uh, you can get quite detailed about that. But how would I describe an A field? This A field is traveling to the right. How would I, dis how would I write an A field that is traveling to the left? Um, there's my A field. How do I? Be a plus? Yeah, just switch the sign. Kx plus omega t travels to the left. And, uh, and this antenna would have waves propagating <coughs> in both directions from it. You have over on one side, it's traveling away, and on the other side, it's traveling in the opposite direction, also away from the antenna. So you have both solutions in the full, both pieces in the full solution. Okay, now I want to want to discuss what happens to a charged particle. I'm going to put a charged particle in this A field and see what happens to it. And the, uh, you could do it in stages by first looking at E and B course, uh, which I did up here, here, here are the e, e and B fields. And uh, using the E and B field, you can look at the force on the particle. So we're going to do that here in just a second. But first, I'm going to pause, see if you have any questions about the worksheet. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Would you ever take a curl with like space and time somehow? Yes. So uh, we didn't spend enough time, unfortunately. I would like to spend more time on this, considering the, the formulation of special relativity. And in the chapter, in chapter 10, where in the mechanics book, he does go into the mathematics of so called space time, where the coordinate. Uh, is augmented by a time variable. And so we're working in a in, in this space time is a four dimensional uh, a coordinate system. It's not Cartesian, but it's a four dimensional coordinate system, so called space time. And you can you can write a lot of what we have written in terms of Maxwell's equations, for example, in a very compact form using this four dimensional space time. So you have also partial derivatives with respect to x, y and 1 over c d by dt. Uh, so for example, let's, let's generalize this. Let's call this a uh, tilde underneath instead of an arrow on top. And let's try um, j, the current density. So I have jx, jy, jz, and rho. Now I could write the uh, continuity equation in compact form. This is uh, d, d rho dt. So notice that there's a negative sign in this. When I'm taking dot products, I put a negative sign in front of the time part. Uh, and this, so that negative sign, it, whenever when I'm taking dot products of vectors in space-time, I have a negative sign in front of the time component. Uh, the A field can be written then 
as the usual A field with phi. I guess there must be a C in here probably. Uh, and the Lorentz gauge condition is written in this fashion. It's just equal to zero. So that's equal to zero. This is equal to zero. Very compact way of writing electrodynamics. And so you could have, yes, to answer your question, a, a kind of a gradient in this four-dimensional space. And it turns out to be a very compact way. If you, if you alter the rules a little bit, like this negative sign here, kind of a funny thing because it's it's like saying well if, and if you think also remember the equation of motion of a wave front would be x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus c t squared that's a, a wave front propagating out from the source at speed c well that's like if I have uh, those coordinates then this is the the length of the vector in space-time is zero. Well, that's kind of a funny thing because a vector that has no length previously had, had, had all zero components, but because of that negative sign, there things that have zero length in space-time are like, for example, describing the wavefront propagating out from the source. It's kind of an odd thing, right? That negative sign is very peculiar, but it uh, allows you to write all of the mathematics in a very compact form. Um, so uh, I wish we had time to go further into this because electromagnetism is itself uh, uh, consistent, compatible with special relativity. Maxwell's equations are compatible with uh, special relativity. If you take into account things like length contraction, so you have a, uh, a line charge that's moving because of its motion, it's going to contract, and so the charge density increases by a factor of gamma. You remember that factor from relativity. Uh, or if you have a current carrying wire, you have some parts moving and the other parts are moving, and now the wire is moving, for example, and now you get the electric field and the magnetic field are, are related to each other. The measurements of the electric and magnetic field are related to each other. It's actually all consistent with Maxwell's <coughs> equations as long as you take into account the length contraction and the charge density, for example and the length contraction and the current density. So it turns out Maxwell's equations are consistent with special relativity. And, and some evidence of it that you've just seen, in fact, we have waves that propagate at the speed of light independent of the speed of the source or the speed of the observer. Remember in special relativity, we said it was necessary that the speed of light be independent of the source and the observer. And in fact, that's what we get out of Maxwell's equation. So uh, people didn't realize it when Maxwell wrote his equations down that in fact, you know, because they didn't, special relativity had yet to be understood. Um, but it was, uh, I think, helped lead the way into the discussion, into the understanding of special relativity, that there was already a, a relativistic theory uh, if, it, if it were treated correctly. Okay, so now, uh, after that tangent, let's, let's go back and discuss radiation. Now we have this field Let's just write kx minus omega t. Okay, and uh, and we've got the the E field and the B field associated with that, which we derived previously. Now let's suppose this field impinges on a charged particle. Now there's what's going to happen to it? Well, if it's if the particle starts off at rest, it's going to have a force produced on it, even though this is current in the wire. We're not considering the, the charge density. We're only considering, not the phi, but only the A field. There's a force produced on a particle at rest because there's an A dot effect. And so the, the E field will produce a force on a charged particle. And what direction will it start moving? Again, the E field is in the Y direction. So I suppose it's a positive particle. Yeah, it'll start moving it up or down. I think the yeah, depending on up or down, depending on where you are in the field. So the move, the E field is oscillating with the frequency omega. So it's going to start trying to drive. It's going to be a driving force, frequency omega along the y direction, and uh, so it would the force due to the E field would be QE. 
And uh, E, we found out earlier, uh, wasn't it negative Y? Uh, I'm going to go back and get it here. Negative 1 over negative omega A naught. sine kx minus omega t. Okay, so that would be, uh, that would have a frequency of, of omega. Okay, now, um, um, but that turns out to give uh, runaway solutions. We need to, he, he suggests instead to have a charged particle that's on the end of a spring. We're going to have a uh, uh, say, suppose you have a, um, let's see if I can draw this better, a charged particle on the end of a spring. Okay. Uh, and so there's a spring constant, K, oops, different, I want a different, yeah, okay. So I'm going to, uh, let's, it's, I, I don't want to use the same symbol twice, that would be a little confusing. But there's a spring constant, I'll call it capital K for the spring, and then there's a mass for the particle. Okay, and so there's omega naught is the square root of, the, of that spring constant divided by the mass of the particle. So that's a that's a frequency of the simple harmonic oscillator that this wave is impinging on. So he's imagining, for example, could be a really simple model of an atom that uh, there's a charge that's on the end of a spring because there's a natural frequency associated with this motion. That's a really crude hand-waving thing at this point because we don't know much about atoms in, in, in this description. So, but um, let's suppose that there is a simple harmonic oscillator like this. And the other thing he wants to do is to add a damping, uh, gamma uh, damping factor. Okay, so we have an equation of motion mx double dot plus gamma x dot plus k spring x is equal to then that driving force from just the electric field. We're just considering the electric field. Obviously, we, we've got another piece that we've left out of this, but let's just consider it one part at a time. The force of the electric field, and he divides by the mass. Uh, and so this is the gamma over m is, he calls it b, and then uh, you can write it in terms of that frequency. Okay, now remember this driving force has a frequency omega. So what does that equation look like? There's the system. The third example is actually similar to one we did before. Right, this is the damp-driven oscillator, damp-driven harmonic oscillator. The damping is given by, the, the driver is given by the frequency, determined, uh, has a frequency omega, which is determined by the antenna way over there somewhere. And then there's the uh, resonant or natural frequency of the oscillator omega zero. So he, he's going to consider, I think, just to, to make things simple, he's going to consider that we're actually near resonance or on resonance. And so we choose the oscillator to be resonant with the radiation that's coming out. He wants to see what's going to happen when we get that maximum e effect. Because the oscillator is chosen, the frequency of the oscillator is chosen to be resonant with the radiation. We want to see what's going to happen. Okay, so now you're going to see, as a result, you get uh, driven oscillation in the y direction. So, oh, I should, I should write this as... To be consistent here, I'm sorry, I should use uh, y because y is the uh, coordinate in that direction. Coordinate system that I chose. Okay. Okay, and then we can we can plot the velocity in the y direction, of course, is just y dot. Right? And remember, so y is going to be some kind of of some kind of amplitude. times cosine omega t plus phi 
it's going to respond in, in, in frequency with the driver, but there's this phase shift. But if we choose the re resonant condition, the phase shift, I think, is uh, negative pi over 2, which makes us right at resonance. So it simplifies the math a little bit to choose the, res to choose, uh, the oscillator to be resonant with the radiation. Okay, so now it's moving up and down. Now let's consider what happens from the B field. The B field is present, and it's in sync with the electric field. But this oscillator is not quite in sync, right? It's shift to pi over 2, so it's not moving quite in sync. So B cross B is in what direction? B is in the Z direction. B cross B, B is along Z. Z is along Y. So V cross B, yeah, it's in the X direction. And because of this relationship between E and B and the response of this driver, the force is always positive in every part of the oscillation. Every part of the cycle, the force is positive. So there's actually a positive force. F, X is greater than or equal to zero for all time. It goes like cosine squared omega t. So at most it's zero. So there's a it's pushing it away. It keeps pushing, never pulls it back. Even though there's the oscillating fields, the combination, the fields are in sync with each other in such a way that it's always pushing away. And so the antenna ends up pushing this oscillator away. Okay. So in other words, what has happened is this radiation. This is a radiation field. The radiation field has delivered momentum to the particle, pushing it away. And so you could say analogically the plana has impetus, but only analogically.